Yo, everybody! It is what? It is two. Two Dynamite Dudes with Attitude. It is I, Dominic D'Angelo of WrestleZone.com, with my degenerate brother putting his hand in front of the screen. Uh, also, a little under the weather today, wearing a hat indoors and a uh, hoodie, looking looking quite thuggish. Almost like you're in the ready for a parking lot fight, Marcus. That's right. Um, yeah. I should have painted my face for this Dom. Dead Kennedy style. Or not Dead Kennedy's Dead President style. <laughs> Man, that was cool. I thought that was cool that they did that. Uh and we'll we'll get to that in a moment. But yeah, people, I do not have COVID. I have a cold. So <laughs> <laughs> let's not get too crazy. Uh I'm fine. I'm, I'm sure fine. everybody was immediately thought of that and uh you were like you were part of it. They were really concerned for you, Marcus. Well I'm I have no doubt about that. Our legions, they're good. Our legions of fans, which real quick, I'm going to check on Facebook and see uh, about 30 minutes ago, I posted to see if anybody wanted, had any questions going on. Um, I don't, dumb. Huh? I don't like our odds. Go I ahead. don't like our odds either, but we're going to find out. Nope. Nope. Zero. Absolutely zero. <laughs> All right, hey, we'll we'll create questions with with some of our clients and give answers as well. So, Marcus, let's get right to it. Uh, the parking lot fight. Uh, Jr. praised it as the best street fight he's ever called. Mick Foley said he could never do a street fight like that. And then Dave Meltzer gave it five stars today in the Wrestling Observer. So, Mark, let's get your thoughts. What did you think? Of the well, main event between the best friends, Santini uh, my, and Ortiz. My first thought is that Melter's getting a little liberal with the uh, with the use of the stars recently. Uh, he's like, I mean, I saw it not too long ago. It was like a throwaway match. He gave like a like four point three stars or something stupid like that. It's like let's let's pile it back a little bit. Uh, yeah, just a touch. It's like uh, that's like saying uh, like a Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels, WrestleMania twelve. Uh, yep, way up here. And then it's like, oh, that one episode of Dynamite, that one throwaway match, also way up here on that level. It's like, come on. It's not. It's not. Uh, like, the the event makes a big difference. The amount of people that that, that the, the match draws makes a big difference. And then, like, the, the overall quality of the match all the way through, how people sell, the story behind the match. So, like, you can't just say, like, well, uh, Nick Jackson or Matt Jackson came out and he did a bunch of great moves and it was incredible athleticism. Four and three quarter stars. Said, no man, but that's, that shouldn't be how that works. Marcus, isn't it at Melter's discretion anyways, though? Because he kind of he made the star rating. So, I mean, I I guess it's up to his discretion, but like that doesn't mean that all of us should have to buy into it. You know, of course it's up to his discretion. He's the one who has the the Wrestling Observer, but like that doesn't mean that all the rest of us should just be like, well, that's what it is. Then you know, he gave. <laughs> Sure. No, no. It's, I mean, it's, it's a subjective art form. So, right. Um, so, and well, it's just I, like, is AEW, do, do they have him on the bankroll? Why is he, why is he dishing out these stars? Like, Marcus, uh, I cannot tell you how often he gets that. So, I mean, I don't know. He just, I mean, he's friends with the guys. That's for sure. I definitely don't, he's definitely not on the payroll. I think that's a ludicrous kind of idea. Well, but, he, he, I remember back in the day, he used to bury Dustin Rhodes all the time on the Observer. Uh, you know, like 94, 95 Dustin Rhodes. He had nothing positive to say about him. So it's interesting. I would be interested to hear what he has to say about some of his more modern stuff. Uh, but in any case, Dominic, I digress. Uh, the street match, yes, the street fight was incredible. Uh, I thought it was really well done. Um, there was like, it was one of those those things that it really makes you like, kind of step back uh, and like catch your breath a little bit as you're watching it. Like when, when, uh, when he got power bombed and got all that glass in his back when that happened to Trent, that was like a, you know, like a hold your breath, like, Ooh, Oh my God. Kind of like a very visceral reaction. So I thought that was cool. I, I think that they should have sold more. Some of them uh, like Ortiz got just the, the dog shit beat out of him at one point. They were like, they were like stomping him with like the hood of the car. They were yeah. like, devastating horrific things in theory happening to him and then like within five minutes he was up and he was like competitive again like they need to sell a little bit more where like Ortiz should have been like laid out for 10 minutes <laughs> just like flat 
face down on the ground, a non-factor, while they both worked on Santana following that. But, <coughs> excuse me. But uh, overall, it was good. Cool match. Good setup. Uh, I feel like the Orange Cassidy thing, uh, it was pretty good. Uh, you know, usually I feel like they sort of force it in, but this time it seemed a little bit appropriate. Uh, but yeah, man, I liked it. What did you think? Yeah, I, uh, so I covered it for the site and, uh, I wanted to, after hearing like, and I was into it, I was invested into it, but I certainly like, I think I was kind of missing some aspects of it still because, when I wrote it, uh, and I just heard JR's feedback, like, best street fight I've ever called, and then I saw McFoley's response to it, and then, yeah, then Meltzer's rating, too. But, like, I was like, I gotta kind of go back and watch what I feel. So, right before we recorded here, I went back and rewatched it, and it was really good. And um, something that should be said, too, is, like, I've never seen any a series of moves better executed on top of cars than this match. Like, <laughs> you know, you get a lot of spots on top of cars or on hood of cars. They nailed those spots for the most part, you know, like, and, uh, it really at hard hitting. I think they utilize the environment extremely well, like from the beginning when, uh, Chuck smashed, uh, Santana's, uh, face into the side mirror and then uh, all the way up to the them teasing the the pickup truck where they put the board like way at the beginning of the match uh, on top of it, and then at the end the payoff was there with Trent. Um, but yeah, uh, well done. At well, at first watch, I was like, I don't know about the Orange Cassidy spot because I was like, what if what would happen if he didn't need to come out of there? You know, he was just in the trunk the whole time. But you know, it's Orange Cassidy and he's an enigma and. Uh, it works out that way. And I thought it was pretty cool to incorporate him into it. And uh, I really liked it. I really liked the match. I think it elevates. Uh, I, and this was another kind of question I had at the end. I was like, well, Santino Ortiz lost. And I was like, they lose. But I think this loss didn't matter. I think they really put themselves in a good spot following this match. What do you think about that? Uh, yeah, no, I, I think that it was hands down the best showing by Santana and Ortiz so far in uh, AEW. Um, you know, it's they sort of get lost in the whole inner circle thing to me because Sammy Guevara, he's such like a <coughs> he's such like a big personality and uh, like such a smarmy, like paying the ass little bratty look that he like he really pops for the inner circle. Jericho obviously does. You got Jake Hager, former WWE champion. Uh, so, of course, he. He's he kind of pops. So these two sort of like fade into the background. Um, but then this match comes along and it, it kind of makes you stop and pay a little bit more attention to these guys. The other aspect is uh, I loved the uh, the dead president's face paint thing that they were doing. Uh, I think that that should be something that they do for the rest of their careers uh, because not consistently like not week in and week out, but like for special occasions. I'm like 100 percent for that. You know what I mean? Like where they're like, all right, we're going to fuck some serious shit up and boom, here comes the face paint, you know, almost like Finn Balor and the demon, you know, he brings that out once in a while. I think that's the way to handle it. Yeah. But like a serious match, uh, they break that out. Yeah. Yeah. Struggling. Go ahead. That's all right. What did you think about, how about the best friends? What, how do you feel them coming out of it and, uh, where you want to see them go? I thought it was good with Trent's mom. It did make me laugh at the end. It was just ridiculous. Uh, also, I was like, question wow. real quick, though. Question real quick. Did uh, Sue, did she lay some tarp down on the back seat when Trent got in for her bloody son? That's all I could think. She was, <laughs> she like hugged him and then he's like about to sit on that upholstery with his bloody back. And I was like, oh my God. Oh boy. <coughs> that on first watch, on first watch, I didn't notice his back was that bloody either. Like, I didn't notice. I was like, where did all that? I just saw blood on the pavement and I was like, where did all that come from? <laughs> That was like all him. He also hit himself in the face at one point with, with like a piece of the lumber, and he was bleeding from that from his eyes. So like he was just a fucking mess. Uh, so yeah, I imagine he had to pay for his mom to get her car reupholstered. But uh, it was I, I thought that was funny. Uh, I also thought it was funny how like they all get in and she's like very slowly pulling away, kind of like a mom might if there was like a lot of like a big crowd of people around. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah, and then she flips the bird. So I, I it did crack me up a little bit. Um, yeah, I thought the best friends, uh, you know, came out looking pretty good. I'm not a big Chuck Taylor fan. 
I, I don't know what it is about him. Uh, his look definitely like he just looks like he looks like he could work at fucking Blockbuster. You know, like he just doesn't look like the sort of like if that dude was coming at me, I, I don't think I would be all that intimidated just based on his body style. He wears like the muscle rings around his biceps. And it's like, uh, why? I don't know. He, he just looks like he, he looks like just a regular dude. And there's no reason for the muscle rings. Uh, he's a good. Worker. Oh, but I'll say, though, I uh, I saw them in Vegas at, when I was at All Out, like beforehand and uh, not All Out. Wow. That's, it was for the ticket announcement party so back in february of last year and uh chuck's a pretty big dude though he's a big dude like yeah so i mean i you know you can criticize for his body and stuff like that i kind of do like him i just i'm trying to figure out you know what's next for them exactly and I, i would like to see them feud with like maybe the dark order or something like that go into something to that effect you know you could put them up against Grayson and Evil Uno, uh, just to have something go involved with that. And then, like, I don't know yet. I'm just, I'm curious. I'm just curious what they're going to do with them, what they're going to do with Orange Cassidy coming up. Uh, a lot of questions I'm, I have going into it. But I, I liked it. I think they're all, both, both teams are in a really good position following this. And um, I really think Santino Ortiz are going to come off in a major program coming up after this. You know, like, they're going to go on this dominant winning streak that we have it's like i think this loss will put them in into another into the echelon that we kind of want them have been wanting them since they've debuted over a year ago at this point so i think we're finally going to get that coming up so yeah. you know i think that obviously Trent's mom being involved is like it's a pretty big thing through his career right now it's really like what people are associating with but again it's kind of like the Orange cassidy thing where it's like okay you got this and it's great right now but like in a year is it going to be great certainly not in two years it won't be uh so like what's what do you what do you have next what else do you what is there to you as a wrestler uh how are you going to progress so yeah it's uh i hope they come up with something (laughs) i think i think trent's got a great look great talent uh you know so he could he could really uh you know be something special so uh, yeah i'll be interested to see how they how they approach it yeah yeah man um let's see all right next up i have uh thunder rosa versus evil east the nwa women's world title on the line um a little bit of controversy heading into it uh, a lot of talk rumors about uh evil east not cooperating um and um maybe some uh actual punches being thrown and stuff like that in the match uh that's another match i went back and watched because as i was doing it uh as i was writing it i was like tuning it out and i thought it was a good match and um watched it again didn't necessarily see uh anything too too suspicious i think uh there was a moment and i don't know if you saw this online where uh ivalice was really no selling uh a full nelson that thunder rosa was putting on her and um but you know, uh, as I and that might have happened during the commercial break. I don't know when that happened exactly because as I was watching it again today, um, I didn't see anything too too like stand out. Like you know, there might have been some moments, but overall, at the end, like the end kind of worked and everything like that. And I thought it was a great match. Um, what do you think, man? Uh, yeah, I've heard that there's conflicting reports as to whether or not there was a shoot incident going on. You know, like theoretically. I can't picture a shoot taking place. <coughs> Sorry, in AEW, it's hard for me to picture that because, like, Tony Khan doesn't seem like he would tolerate that kind of shit. Yeah. Um, he's, he's like he he wants everybody to get along. This is his this is his party, and he I I picture him wanting things to go a very specific way with his talent. Um, also, Thunder Rosa is not under contract. I don't think he is under, under contract with the company. So why would you fuck yourself by going out for a match? And then start shooting with your opponent. Um, uh, to me, that's just bad business. It's a stupid move. So I don't think that there was a shoot. Uh, I think that Thunder Rosa is naturally pretty stiff um, yeah. in the ring. So I think that that may have contributed. Like, cause she, I mean, she's given stiff shots and taken stiff shots. Uh, yeah. So like, I, kinda uh, that- I'm kind of with you though. I don't think I don't know. I mean, uh, I haven't really gotten a chance to like 
I didn't look at like anything. If anything was said in the Observer, I didn't look if anything. You know, I've heard stuff, just read stuff on Twitter and things like that. And um, no, you know, like um, I couldn't imagine that happening. Evilise is known to cause problems and has, you know, been in situations where like she's been kind of like uh, a detriment to herself in certain ways. So um, I something like that could happen. But Thunder Rose is a professional, though, like, and she handles things like a professional. And she's been working with Dustin Rose, like, backstage with the women's division and things like that, too. So, um, you know what? And I don't think Thunder Rose would be somebody to fuck with either because she's <laughs> in MMA and she takes uh, wrestling very, very seriously. So, um, I believe Lisa is dabbling in MMA as well. Um, so, you know, it, it, she wouldn't be any, way, anybody to piss with either. And, I mean, maybe if it was a shoot, something like that could be the genesis of it, where it's just like, oh, you want to give me a stiff shot? Like, I'm pretty damn tough, too. You yeah. know, and potato back. That would be the only thing that, that makes me think that there's a possibility. Also, <coughs> the whole thing where uh, Thunder Rosa is kind of hated, I think, because she's so lauded now in the wrestling world. Everybody loves Thunder Rosa. Um uh, myself included. I, I've I've been on here before saying I think she's the best wrestler, uh, female wrestler in the business right now. Um, so I I'm sure that the other girls hear that kind of shit and like yeah, it would it would probably motivate you, piss you off, and make you a little bit more aggressive out there. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah dude. Uh, I thought still, nonetheless, e- even if there was stiff shots or you know somebody was no selling or whatever, I thought the match was still great. Like. You know, yeah, I thought it was really well done. So that Thunder, that Thunder Rosa drop kick is something to be old. My oh my goodness. gosh, yeah, dude. Or that corner clothesline that she made nearing the end of the match too. Uh, and then she dropped the double knees, and then um, the tombstone was really great too. I liked that a lot. And how she's built from the graveyards of Tijuana. I thought that was pretty awesome too. So. She's she's a badass, and I I love watching her work, dude. And that's you know what what I really like about like that's what makes me like wrestling are competitors like that stars like that that take themselves seriously that take the business seriously and don't fuck around <laughs> i love ftr i hope we're talking about them soon yes um let's uh, yeah let's actually talk about that the opening match because uh it's like jurassic express uh somebody uh you've been critical of and i too have kind of joined in on that uh, particularly with luchasaurus going up against ftr your team uh of AEW and uh you know uh the tag team champs too so mark what were your thoughts on that baby well i thought it was luchasaurus's best match that i've seen so far in AEW, and there's a very very good reason for it um and that's because of ftr and the way that they managed it so luchasaurus's attack is very interesting uh you know the way that he approaches it his his kicks his backflips. I think I think I've kind of figured out the the hack or the way to to fix Luchasaurus, and it's this match where it's okay. He's a huge guy. And he's got all this great stuff he can do, but like all the stuff that he can do should be reserved for closer to the end of the match. Um, and because FTR very clearly managed most of this match, I think I I think it's safe to say that they were sort of like calling it calling the match. Uh, I think so too. Yeah. They called it in a fashion where it's a logical match where if you've got a smaller guy and a bigger guy as a tag team, you want to keep the smaller guy in the ring for the longer period of time uh, and, and actively keep him away from the bigger guy. <coughs> Sorry, man. Uh, you want to actively keep him away from the bigger guy. And that's what they did. So like they were they were actively trying to keep Jungle Boy from tagging Luchasaurus in. And so then when Luchasaurus does finally come in, he can just pull all of his tricks out of the bag and it look it and it makes sense so uh this time around because they did that luchasaurus did all of his usual shit where he does like the backflip and all that stuff but to me it was fine because it's like he finally got into the into the ring and now he's cutting loose on these guys so uh ftr is just they're they're the best there is in the business right now a couple legitimate badasses uh jungle boy uh the way how fluid he is in the ring reminds me a little bit of owen hart oh nice yeah wow yeah. Yeah. No, I, that's good. That's a good comparison, I think. Um, I like the finish, you know, uh, the dirty finish where, you know, they held uh, 
uh, Cash held on to his leg, and then even Tully joined in on it. So a uh, good uh, under ta- underhanded tactic to win the match. Um, it, was, it was like a perfect heel finish. That's what heels would do under these circumstances. Yeah. Speaking of heels real quick, too. That before that match started off, who came out but the Young Bucks to super kick uh, the referee, Mike Posey, and then walk off. Backstage, we got to see Tony Khan get thrown a lot of cash. Uh, what would you think of that little uh, moment to start off the show? Um, well, I, like, can we just say that the Young Bucks are now officially healed? I mean, they have to be, right? Right? Yeah. I don't know how, how they can't. And that's what's making me wonder, too. You've got <laughs> FTR's heels. You have the Young Bucks' as heels. Uh, Jericho and Hager are in the tag division as heels. Santino and Ortiz. Uh, yeah, what's uh, what's the deal with that? What do you think's uh, what do you think's the lay of the land there? I think what they're trying to do is just show that uh, that the Young Bucks are they're not pissing around anymore. They're fighting mad, and uh, they don't care who gets in their way. As baby faces, they're picturing themselves as baby faces. I think in this scenario. But they don't under they don't seem to understand that the shit that they're doing makes them heels. So I don't know, maybe I'm mistaken. Maybe they're trying to turn heel. <coughs> but even if they are, that in itself doesn't make sense. We're very clearly building toward FTR and the Young Bucks. I think that that's been the plan all along. FTR is heels, or, or rather, are heels. Um, clear cut, too. They're clear cut heels. So if you make the Young Bucks heels, then what exactly are the stakes here? Uh, it's it should be every the the people who everybody's cheering for the baby faces coming up against these heels that keep fucking cheating. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh man. Yeah, I feel you though. Uh, it's I don't know where they're gonna go with it. Um, and that gives let's lead us into this too. Is um, my favorite match. I really I mean I really from an in ring standpoint, like I the parking lot fight was undeniably special. I feel. But from an entering standpoint, my favorite match was Hangman and Frankie Kazarian, the singles match between those two. Um, uh, Kaz is awesome as a singles competitor, and I think it was a really, really good showcase for Hangman, too. Um, yeah. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that or input on that match? Um, Kenny was on commentary, so we can talk about that real quick, too. But um, what you, what'd you think of the match in general? Uh, I thought it was a good match. I thought it was well worked. Uh, I feel like they are ruining Hangman a little bit uh, with this whole like <laughs> he's acting like like a middle schooler who's kind of being spurned by his friends, you know, with like almost like the teary looking eyes. Except like he is turning into like a not likable alcoholic as a result of it. It seems uh, so. He's like he's like drinking to excess and like all upset and emo all the time. And he like looks. After the match, he's just like, he like looks where he knew his friend was, and then his friend isn't there, and it's like he said. The Incredible Hulk music theme plays. Right. And it's like, is he a baby face? Because I want to slap him. Uh, like, like I, uh, somebody who, who behaves that way, is to me, I'd be like, I'm not afraid of that guy. Well, he's, he's like, he's being a complete, a complete coward out there. Uh, so like, I can't really, I can't respect what they're doing with a talented guy like, like Hangman Page. I think they're kind of burying him, whether they mean to or not. Um, like, but, and Kenny Omega is just as bad in this scenario because he's just like, well, you won the match and now I'm leaving. And he just like, <laughs> he just, like leaves, uh, which again is like a very middle school thing, which is like, I don't want to talk to him. So I'm leaving now. And like, he just goes and leaves. It's like, guys, like, let's remember, like. Could you ever see like Stan Hansen doing that? Any of this? Like that that should be like the bar for pro wrestlers. Like, would Stan Hansen do what I'm about to do? No, then I'm not doing it. <laughs> I'm not doing that. <laughs> like that I think that that's how they should look at things. Uh, uh we we're incorporating the Stan Hansen rule on this show now. <laughs> where that's how we're gonna gauge things. I think we should, for real. Yeah. So Stan Hansen would not do that. Would Stan Hansen pour a beer on a fan's head and tear their sign if he was being yes. a heel? If he was being a heel, he would. Yes. Uh, so I, I, if you were trying to get him over as a baby face, probably not. And if you were to do that in Japan, the crowd would just be running away in fear anyway. So. Yes. So uh, so yeah, we should we should start incorporating the Stan Hansen rule of thumb. Yes. Um, yeah, Kenny on commentary. I think he really teased being a heel. I I don't. I'm thinking that was intentional, but he was like kind of showing animosity towards. 
uh, Hangman being able to handle himself on his own, uh, I noticed. And so um, I kind of liked Kenny on commentary, though, too. I will say that. Like, I feel he he overall did a pretty good job of being, like, engaging yet uh, kind of analytical on certain things. So um, I don't know. I'm, I don't know. The despondent Adam Page ultimately is not a good spot for him, but I don't feel it's, it didn't necessarily like, oh, man, they're effing him up or things like that. I, if they turn this around quick, I think they can get out of it without uh, any damage to Hangman. So um, that's kind of where I'm at on it right now. So, Well, they better turn it around because Stan Hansen would not sadly drink uh, because his friends aren't talking to him. That's correct. He would drink angrily and then take his vengeance out on someone. Yeah, like Stan Hansen would be like, I'm going to have a beer and then I'm going to kick the crap out of this guy who was my friend 10 minutes ago. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what happened. Um, yeah, uh, let's talk about this. MJF had a squash match against Sean Dean, but then cut a promo and an interesting promo uh, talking about factions and how there's a lot of factions in AEW, but maybe it seems like he should form some sort of group because he considers himself a lone wolf and he might have to form his wolf pack. Um, are we seeing Scott Hall, Marcus on AEW? Uh, I would like to think so. It would be very interesting to see Scott Hall paired up with somebody like, uh, like MJF. I suspect that his legends contract with WWE is going to prohibit that, but you know, I, you know, wishful thinking, wishful what thinking. If, <laughs> Paul and Nash joined MJF and Wardlow. I'll tell you what, that would pop the ratings. Oh my gosh. Could you imagine that? Dude, damn. That would be something. That would be something. Well, so do you think, uh, I think he might, He MJF's going to do obviously do something heelish. He's teasing something, whether it's like just pulling a red herring on us, just to F with everybody and uh, maybe get their hopes up on something. I don't know. Uh, do you think he's forming a faction or don't you? Uh, yes, uh, there's no other reason to bring it up. Uh, so I think that there's something like that brewing. Or uh, he intends to join a faction, which, by the way, <coughs> if he were to join FTR and Tully, uh, I, I could see that making a lot of sense. <coughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I see that, too. I mean, I don't know. It, yeah, I guess it would make more sense. You know, I don't know. It's a lot of. So he's he's like the, the annoying, uh, you know, like arrogant heel uh kind of like a rick flair is he not where it's uh you know he loves himself wears the finest burberry scarves you know he's got this ring he's trying to make people kiss all the time uh so yeah i mean if if you want to get that over as a heel faction why not and then you've got wardlow it's, it's their their big guy there the the heater uh i can see it working very very well yeah yeah you know you got might have something there i don't know i don't know uh Okay, the Mox and Archer tag uh, tease for next week. So we see Archer and Jake in the ring, and, um, you know, they cut a promo. Jake starts it off, and then uh, Archer finishes it off, and out comes Moxley. And um, who? Out comes Taz. Out comes Taz, correct. Yes, thank you. Out comes Taz saying that they formed alliance, and then they got Brian Cage and Ricky Starks. And once Archer wins that world title, he promises to give a shot to Brian Cage. So uh, who comes out but Moxley out of the crowd? Oh, go ahead, Mark. You got something to say? Yeah, which, again, this we're, we're thinking logically, which is good. So, like, uh, the, there's a reason why Taz is – he's not just arbitrarily saying, like, we want to help you. No, it's yeah. like Taz has his own reasons. So – I like that kind of stuff in wrestling. I like that they're like, they, you know, uh, clearly creative is like, I, I let's get these guys together. Um, and then it's like, okay, well, let's logically think about how to do it instead of just throwing them together. Kind of like what's going on with the weird Eddie Kingston situation. But go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, Moxley comes out. Uh, and then who attacks from behind? They tease that fan. Like, it could, did you hear last week about a fan, like, kind of approaching Moxley last week? And uh, security had to pull them away and stuff like that. Did you hear that? Oh, no, I didn't. Yeah, so, like, a fan apparently was uh, ran down towards Moxley, whether it was to, like, just touch him or something like that. But security, like, got, handled it. So they teased that again. But this time it was with absolute Ricky Starks, and he attacks him. 
and then in comes Cage and attacks him and uh, sets up for the new assignee of AEW, Will Hobbs, to come in and make the save. Um, and uh, he's their tag. He's Moxley's tag partner for next week, Moxley Revealed, and also Darby Allen. So, uh, Marcus, what do you think of that? Uh, you don't know too much of Will Hobbs at this point in time, do you? Because you didn't see him on uh, the pay-per-view because he was on he was in the Battle Royal and he had a showcase there. And he's been on Dark 2, uh, big presence, and uh, they've been really putting him over here. So what do you think of that whole alliance going on? I saw him as an enhancement talent for somebody, <coughs> and I remember thinking that he looked good. I think he was an enhancement talent for Darby Allen, actually. Um, you might be right. Yeah, I think you're right. I believe he was, uh, but I remember thinking, like, man, it's a pretty big dude uh, to be jobbing to uh, Darby. But I was like, hey, that's cool. You know, like, he seems like he can work. Uh, and when I saw he was signed, I was like, oh, cool, that guy, like that that big guy, cool, that's nice. Uh, so yeah, like he he seems like he can work. He's got a good look. Um, so I'm optimistic about him. Don't know enough about him yet, uh, but you know, he's he's got some of the intangibles. So uh, let's see if he's he can put all the pieces together. Uh, but yeah, man. Again, you know, a logical situation afoot. You know, who would go figure in in modern wrestling? Something that makes sense. You know, like w- what they used to do back in the day <coughs> on free TV. You give away a tag match where you keep trying to you alternate people so that like the guys who are meeting at the pay per view don't necessarily touch uh, yeah. at least not too much throughout the match. Um, and uh, and then like it helps to build to the pay per view where it's like, man, I got to see these guys actually throw down finally you know yeah. uh, so that's that's how they played it and it's smart and uh yeah so this this is some of the better stuff that's happening in aew yeah no i i think uh all that direction and what they're setting up for those guys uh team taz lance archer jake in the mix and then you got yeah a guy like moxley and darby and a newcomer like will hobbs you're elevating somebody right immediately right off the bat which you never get in WWE anymore like somebody doesn't come in and make an impact like and if they do it only lasts for a couple weeks and then they're just leveled out like everybody else now you have an opportunity to just put somebody right up, up front to them and elevate them immediately and uh so it's a good spot for will hobbs he's got a great backstory and um yeah it'll be interesting to see him in the mix of things so um, well, so that's gonna bring in talent and like getting them over where is matt cardona what's going on with him Dude, I got no clue, man. He's got those, those five dates or whatever it was, maybe a five thing he was going to do. Um, I, I, what, he's been on like three or four times? I don't know. So I don't know, dude. He, he doesn't seem like he's going to be a fit. Does it seem that way to you? I mean, I think he could be, but like they're not doing anything with him. So like he's not going to be a fit if you don't put him on TV, give him promos. Uh, try to establish who he is as a talent aside from, oh, that's Cody's friend who used to be Zack Ryder. Like, that's that's not enough to help get no. somebody. Um, also, I thought I remember seeing on Twitter Matt Cardona is all elite, which means he signed a contract with all elite, all elite wrestling, does it not? Um, I don't think so. I think because he was just going on a deal by deal basis or mag- something like that. I don't think he was like signed. But, you know, he's got AEW shirts. He's got two of them. So, I don't know, though. Maybe they just, they know at this moment in time they don't necessarily have a spot for him, like a creative spot for him. But I'm sure the door will open up here if they have plans for him. Maybe they already have something in mind. I don't know. But, uh, yeah, who knows? Um, I feel like there's something that we didn't touch upon. Oh, there was that little segment with Miro and, uh, and Kip Sapien. Uh, nothing really to talk about there, I guess. Was there anything special? Miro looks like he's probably in the best shape of his career oh, so far. Yeah, that that was true. He looked really, really good right there. So, yeah, that's a fact. Um, no, nah, I guess we'll just have to wait and see. That's kind of what I liked about Dynamite this week, too, was you didn't have Cody. You didn't have Brody Lee. You didn't have, like, Moxie was there, but he wasn't, like, a huge, huge presence. Um other big stars like the young bucks only came out for that one little thing hangman was in a match but that was it like you did not have they they didn't give you the whole kit and caboodle this week and it was uh i thought a really really good show overall mark what we didn't do this last week uh and i want to make this a weekly thing is marcus's melter rating so what's your <laughs> melter rating for uh this week marcus you give uh, numbers though you don't 
Well, yeah, you give like you don't give like four and a quarter or things like that. You even go like way into the digits. Like you did a, I think you did like a four point two the one time. So what do you got here? Uh, this time around, Dom, I'm I'm giving it a six point eight. Um, okay. Yeah, so I, that's out of ten for me. Uh, yeah. So, so like I thought there was some really good stuff. I thought there was some stuff where it kind of fell flat. But uh, by and large, you know, uh, good stuff. Uh, and I think that they, you know, certainly got the uh, got the promotion over uh, for a new audience, you know, specifically with that that very interesting street fight. I mean, like, you know, if, if you were flipping by and this is this is why I'm kind of leaning toward even the possibility of Santana and Ortiz always wearing that face paint is if you were a casual fan uh, or maybe not even a fan flipping by. And you saw like two guys in that face paint having like a, a throwdown brawl. I'd be like, "What is this? Like, you gotta stop what you're doing and watch it." And man, let me tell you, if you were to stop what you're doing and watch it and make it to the point where uh, uh, Beretta gets put through uh, that windshield, as woof, man, that's that would that would kind of hook you. Yeah. Let me add this too. Is uh, I told a coworker about like AEW and stuff like that, who was like a casual, way casual fan back in like the Attitude Era and stuff like that, and like I texted him about like the opening match they had a couple weeks ago, I think it was, and um, he really liked it, and uh, I want to say like if this is a match, I want to send him like is be like, hey, check this out, you're gonna really like this, because yeah, it stands out. And um, I like the show a lot overall. Um, I'm I'm gonna give it an eight point two. Um, I think it was a really really good show and just solid throughout. Like nothing really really dampered or you know lowered it down for me at all. Like throughout the whole night. Was there any low points specifically for you? Um, I I think just some of the nonsensical stuff along the way. Um, it probably. <laughs> the easiest part to pick on would be the Miro segment. Um, just because I, you know, the guy looks incredible uh, and they're sort of misusing him right out of the gate. Uh, but aside from that, you know, it, most of it was like pretty good to okay. Uh, you know, like the, the match, it probably should have popped the most Jericho, uh, you know, in a tag match against private party. I was just like, it was all right. Like nothing yeah. special. Yeah. Uh, I think he's teasing a, maybe a match coming up with Mark Quinn or something like that. I kind of got that vibe. I don't know if you did too, but okay. Well, if he is, Jericho needs to stop putting people over so often, so it makes more of an impact when he does put somebody over. Yeah, uh, so. I'm sure. I don't. Th- I couldn't imagine Mark Quinn winning against him. I. I don't think it would happen. I yeah. hope not. Yeah. Um. All right. Last segment. Uh, is AEW Monopoly. Uh, and I'm doing two kind of unique spots this week. So we did Boardwalk and Park Place last week, and I picked Jericho for Boardwalk and Cody for Park Place. Next, we're going to do what Go is and also what the luxury ta- tax spot is, and that's the spot in between Boardwalk and Park Place where you have to pay $200. So that's the, that's the spot you don't want to land on if you're going there. So Go, I think this is a pretty simple one. Uh, Daly's Place. Just, you pass Daly's Place, you collect 200 bucks. How's that sound? I think that that's pretty good. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, I think that makes sense. Although it does feel like uh, you know, possibly a missed opportunity for somebody like an announcer uh, to like, like maybe Ask just. Ar. <laughs> how about like uh, Justin Roberts doing like an introduction? You know, that's kind of like the go moment, right? Eh, nah, I don't know about that. I don't know. Something to think about. Uh, certainly, the Mister Monopoly at the center of the board has got to be Tony Khan. Am I right? No, no. It's got to be the butcher, right? Like, as far as looks are concerned, sure. But, like, if we're going to make sense of this whole thing, the guy with all the money at the center of everything is Tony Khan. So, like, maybe he should be the one uh, holding the, you the big old You make a fair back. argument. You make a fair argument. Because my project, my next project was going to be able to make the Monopoly man out of somebody. And it was going to be the butcher. But, I don't know, maybe Tony Khan would be pretty interesting. <laughs> Like lot, and the butcher should be on the board as one of the uh, the the properties, should he not? He's a talent there. Yeah, yeah. So, ah, uh, yeah, you got a point. All right. So, yeah, go is Daly's place. Luxury tax 
is MJF. MJF in his dynamite diamond. I am MJF. putting here. here MJF here's my got, argument. Uh, here's my argument for this is, <laughs> all right, you want to embrace a heel, and MJF's like the ultimate heel. Uh, you're not getting any money off of MJF when you own him as a property. So what's going to happen is you land on MJF, He's he's gonna he's gonna give you the short change, man. He's gonna dirty do you dirty. And what's more dirty than being not only positioned right in between two of the top stars of AEW, which puts him in that same kind of category, but you got you gotta pay the money. You're not getting anything off of MJF. So that's my reason for putting MJF there. Because you know what? There's a lot of there's a lot of other stars too that need to go on the board. And I'm still trying to work that all out, but I think MGS is the perfect spot for luxury tax. Oh, remind me, Dominic, what was on the luxury tax piece on the actual like, a ring? So the dynamite what? diamond. How about just his ring? Nah, nah. I think MJF's going there, man. I, to me, it makes more sense to have just MJF his ring, and then let's let's put him on the board with the remaining talent. No, nah, I think he's on luxury tax. Hey. <laughs> Uh, well, let's leave it up to a vote before we make the final the final thing. So yeah. uh, put this up as a poll and say what should be luxury tax: MJF himself or just MJX, MJS's or uh, diamond. diamond? Yeah. Okay. All right. Hey, that's fair enough. We will put a poll. We will see. Hopefully, we don't get as much fe- as <laughs> as crazy as the feedback as we got on Facebook for questions today. So. Uh... Uh, yeah. And by the way, Dominic, for every one of these that we do, so we should maybe even double back for Park Place and Boardwalk. Let's let's you and I had different options laid out, right? Uh, you switched it up. Yeah, so I switched it up. Uh, so maybe we can ignore that one since we just flip flop. But like, how about from now on, every spot that we determine, we should ask. Yeah, I, hey, we could try it out. We could try it out for sure. So, all right, Marcus, how do they follow you on Twitter? At Marcus P. D'Angelo. Check me out there. Uh, I'll be promoting uh, Dallas Cowboys failures and, and celebrating their victories. Yes. Well, um, somebody that you can do that along with, Marcus, is Dustin Rhodes, who I happened to interview uh, this past uh, yesterday, it was. And we talked Dallas Cowboys. He's a big Cowboys fan. But we also talked his school opening, the Rhodes Academy, uh, Wrestling Academy. And then also we talked about uh, just his legacy and what he, he plans to keep on doing in wrestling. And um, what he, how he feel, positions himself with him and Cody as like I asked him about, you know, what his, he thought about uh, being almost like the – people to carry on the legacy of wrestling for everybody, uh, you know, whether you're old school and stuff like that. Uh, he had a lot of interesting stuff to share. We talked about Dak Prescott and uh, him opening up about depression. And uh, Dustin was really, really insightful with that. And just being a big locker room influence and everything like that. It was uh, one of my favorite interviews. Marcus, you know, it's been a long time, but like he was one of my bucket list interviews. So him getting, being able to do that was pretty awesome. And so you'll get to hear that next week on WrestleZone.com. So, and yeah, follow me on Twitter at Dominic D'Angelo. Follow WrestleZone on Twitter at WrestleZoneCom. And go to WrestleZone.com for all your wrestling news needs. Uh, tune in. Type in this podcast into your feed. Uh, any of your choosing. It's Just type in WrestleZone. Podcast should pop right up. And you will get this along with plenty of other content. Uh, countless interviews that we have done. Uh, Matt Seidel, who showed up in AEW as a recent interview. You can hear my Thunder Rose interview, which is still very relevant. Baron Black talks about diversity in wrestling and uh, his, his experience with COVID. A uh, lot, a lot of good interviews. More to come, and that's how it's going. Marcus, you are like the Michael Jordan of this uh, episode today. Playing, it, this is your flu game. So, I through it, Dom. Had the best podcast of my career. <laughs> right, you pulled through in the clutch, man, with the flu. <laughs> So, I, say, our, I love the listeners, Dom. I had to do it for them. That's right. I, I can feel the love just coming through the camera here. That's right. All right. All right, guys. We'll see you next week. Thanks for tuning in. Bye.